Would you stand with me as I read from the 18th chapter of Luke? Jesus has just met with the rich young ruler who turned away from him sorrowful because he was not willing to do what Jesus asked. So beginning in verse 24 of Luke 18, Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come, eternal life. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this, your word infallibly given to us for our edification, for our growth, for our salvation. Help us as we study it today to have a better understanding of who we are and of who you are and help us to live it out as you would have us do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. And if you've not already, please turn to the 18th of Luke. A lady uh, brought her car in for service. And after the technician had looked at it for a while, the manager came out and said, well, what's wrong with the car? He said, oh, it's just, it's just got a couple rattles, but it really is just a case of CTIP. CTIP, the manager said, what is CTIP? And the guy said, customer thinks it's a Porsche. That's the problem. They got a misconception about what this car can really do. Well, according to Jesus, rich people, and frankly, that would include most of us here to, today who are certainly better off than 95% of the people who've ever lived, rich people have a similar misconception. I'm guessing that if I used the word underprivileged this morning, it would conjure up in your mind visions of low-income housing projects, maybe squalid ghettos, soup kitchens, and things like that, and that would be true, right? Those are certainly underprivileged people. But from God's perspective, you'll never guess who are the most underprivileged people in the world. It's rich people, people who have plenty and beyond. Those who are wealthy, according to Jesus, are the most underprivileged people. It's a sliding scale. The more you have, the more this will be true of you. So we all fit in here somewhere. But those who have the most, those who are wealthy, are people who actually operate at a great disadvantage. Jesus says rich people are like somebody operating with one hand tied behind their back. It's, it's kind of a staggering statement, isn't it? Two simple points from this passage illustrate what Jesus has to say, so let's look at them. First of all, there is the poverty of riches. The poverty of riches in verses 24 and 25. Now, uh, before I get into that, there's a kind of an interesting sidebar here. If you'll notice in verse 18, verse 18, the rich young ruler was coming and he was seeking eternal life. In verse 25, Jesus speaks of that in terms of the kingdom of God. And then in verse 26, the disciples ask about that in terms of being saved. So in case you sometimes get confused about some of the terminology of the Bible, here's a place where we can equate the kingdom of God and eternal life and being saved as being one and the same thing. They're all speaking of an eternity with Jesus together in heaven. So this is one place where we can kind of fit those together. And by the way, the kingdom of heaven, which Matthew tends to use in place of the kingdom of God in parallel passages, means the same thing as well. They're all one and the same. So what are the poverty of riches? Well, the rich young man has just chosen riches over relationship with God. If you were here last week, you'll remember that. 
It says that he went away sad, but it tells us in Mark's gospel that Jesus loved him and Jesus was equally sad as he watched that young man walk away. And as he did so, he turns to his disciples and he says, my goodness, how difficult is it for rich people to come to faith? So hard for them. And then he makes that statement that we find in verse 25 about it being harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now that's a, uh, I would call that, you know, we have certain verses in the Bible that take a lot of abuse. I think that's one of them. It gets interpreted a lot of different ways. Some commentators have said, well, the word camel in the original language sounds a lot like the, a word that also means cord or rope. And so they say that's probably what Jesus was saying, as though that made it easier that you could get a rope through the eye of a needle or a cord through the eye of a needle. It would still mean basically the same thing, wouldn't it? But I think the more prominent, probably misinterpretation of this passage is the one that says, well, in the, in the gates, in the old days, in the gates of the cities, there used to be these, they had the big gates that were open so everybody could walk through. But if those got closed at night or they were closed when there was a danger from an enemy or something, there were these small gates. And people could walk through them, but they were too small for anything else. Now, maybe a camel, if you took all of the stuff off his back and he got down on his knees, maybe he could kind of make his way through. So that's what Jesus is talking about, these little gates. The, the only problem is those gates, there were gates where you could have individuals enter, but not usually, and, and they were not common, but they were never called the eye of a needle, at least not that we can find in history anywhere. Furthermore, they were not big enough that a camel could get through with or without a burden on his back. It's a 15th century <laughs> myth, beloved. Jesus is saying this is difficult for a, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And by the way, Luke uses the term for needle that is a surgical needle. So he has a very particular needle in mind. It's a, hy, hy, it's a statement of hyperbole that we've seen Jesus uses often, an exaggerated statement just to say this is how difficult it is for rich people to be saved. It's well nigh impossible. Well, that's a, kind of a, something to think about, isn't it? Hard for a rich person to be saved. And the more you have, the harder it is. So he sadly watches the rich young ruler turned away. Jesus is saying to those who are around, you think wealth is a privilege? I know you do. We all do. Let me tell you, wealthy people are the most underprivileged people on the planet. Faith comes harder for them than it does for anybody. <laughs> Counterintuitive, isn't it? You never think that wealth is a disadvantage, but in light of eternity, it can be. Wealth impoverishes people, at least, at least two ways that we could mention from this passage. Let me illustrate the first one with a story from Brian Chapp Chappell. Brian is a, he was the, he was the chancellor of Covenant Seminary in St. Louis for a number of years. He's doing something else now, and I, I don't, I'm not quite sure what it is, but might, might be back pastoring a church. I'm not sure. But while he was at the seminary, he had a student from Africa named Lawrence who came, and he gave a sermon one day. And in this sermon, Lawrence said this. He said, I've seen the great wealth of the United States, the fine homes and cars and clothes. I've listened to many sermons in churches but I've yet to hear one sermon about heaven. Because everyone has so much in this country, no one preaches about heaven. People here don't seem to need it. In my country, most people have very little, so we preach on heaven all the time. We know how much we need it. That's kind of a, an indictment, isn't it? And it's letting us know one way that riches can impoverish us. If we like what we have here so much that heaven doesn't mean much to us, that we don't long for it, that we don't desire it, that we would just as soon go on in this life forever, then, beloved, we've been impoverished. This life can be great at its best. There's no doubt about that. But believe me, it can't hold a candle 
to what heaven's going to be like. And it can impoverish us if we don't see the need of heaven because we are so ingrained in the things we have here. Randy Alcorn has a really interesting take on this. Some of you read his book, The Treasure Principle, or one of his other books about possessions. He talks about wealth in this sense. He says, you know, it's a physical fact that when it comes to solar bodies, the greater the mass, the stronger the attraction, the greater the pull. You know, so to illustrate, for example, uh, our astronauts, when they went to the moon, you may remember how easily they could hop and skip and run around up there, right? Why? Well, because the mass of the earth is greater than the mass of the moon. So what you weigh on earth is about one-sixth, or is about six times what you would weigh on the moon. That's why Guys want to play golf on the moon. You may remember when Alan Shepard took his six iron up there, right? And he could hit the ball a thousand yards on the moon. Who wouldn't like that? The issue is still to hit it straight. But nevertheless, you can hit it a lot further. There's less mass, so there's less attraction. That's the principle. Now, when mass gets really heavily concentrated, like it does in a fading star, you know, the, the star begins to, it begins to implode upon itself and all the mass that it has begins to come into one little place in the middle. And as that happens, pretty soon it pulls everything in its, in its wake into it. Everything, including light. That's why they form black holes. Light can no longer escape. The attraction is so great that even the energy of light is pulled into it. And Alcorn closes by saying this. He says, wealth is, quote, like a black hole, a gargantuan cosmic vacuum cleaner that sucks us in. Our stuff pulls us like a magnet. It's a true statement, isn't it? We love our stuff. And our stuff can really become the primary point of our lives so easily. Now, Jesus is primarily aiming this at unbelievers, and that's the primary application of this passage. But beloved, the same can happen to us as believers. We can get so tied up in our stuff. It's not that we're going to miss heaven if we've really put our faith in Christ, but boy, we can miss a lot that's, that we can have now of Christ because we're so aimed at having things and getting more of them. It sucks us in. It's what happened to the rich young ruler. It says, but when he heard these things, he became sad because he was extremely rich. He had a lot of mass. And it was pulling him in. The attraction was great. And that's in verse 23. He says that he was extremely sad. The word sad there is really interesting. It's a word that could be translated deeply grieved. He was deeply grieved. Jesus had asked him to sell everything he had and give it to the poor. And the thought of losing all of his stuff caused him to be deeply grieved. Grieved, he just couldn't stand it. But it's exactly the same word that's used in Matthew 26, verse 38, where Jesus talks about the fact that when he came to the Garden of Gethsemane, he was deeply grieved. He says, my, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. And the word sorrowful there is the same word. It's deeply grieved. Well, why was Jesus having this grief? Well, because he realized he was about to suffer the ultimate in dislocation. He was about to suffer the ultimate disorientation. He was about to lose his spiritual center, the core of his identity. Why? He was about to lose his father. It wasn't the physical death that so impacted him. It was the thought of losing the relationship with his father, which was going to happen. Jesus was going to be losing the joy of his life. And here is the rich young ruler using the same word to talk about his loss if he gave his money away. His money was for him the same thing that the father was for Jesus. So did you really mean it when you sang this morning, I'd rather have Jesus? Was that true? Because that's what Jesus is looking for. That's what if we've come to faith in Christ and it's been true at some point in our life, we could have honestly said that. You can't be saved without that being true. But as a Christian now, the question is, have I, am I really following down that path or am I being dragged back into this mass of stuff that wants to pull me in? 
To lose the rich man's money for him would have been to lose himself. So the way riches impoverishes us is becoming more important to us than a relationship with the Father. But there's a second way that wealth sometimes impoverishes people. For some who have enough, it actually leads to the idea they can kind of buy their way in. Actually, we don't have to have that much to think that's true. If we think we're giving a large part of what, we're, what we do have, or some reasonable percentage of it, we sometimes think, wow, this, I'm earning favor with God here. God can't turn me away. Look what I gave. Look what I did. Wealth can impoverish us that way by thinking that we earn our way to God. This was the Pharisees' way of teaching. The Pharisees taught, hey, the more you have, the better, because that's a sign of God's blessing in your life. And the way to get to heaven, the best thing you can do, you had to keep the law, but the best thing is the almsgiving. That was at the core of what they did. That's why they even stole from money that really should have been given to their parents. Jesus accuses them of that. So that they could give it in the temple. They wanted two things. They wanted to be seen by men and they wanted to guarantee their entrance into heaven. They felt like their money and their giving could do that. And if you don't think that kind of was a fixation with the people at that time. Look at the response of the disciples in verse 26. It says, those who heard when Jesus said, it's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. They said to him, well, then who can be saved? In other words, if, if rich people aren't here, if rich people can't get there, well, who can? It's because they believed that wealth gave them an advantage. And here is Jesus saying that Rich people are underprivileged. They have, they're having a hard time grasping that. That's a concept that would not have entered their mind that they certainly would not have been taught before. They thought that wealth and almsgiving was a sign of God's blessing. One of the Jewish rabbis said it this way. He said, It is better to give alms than to lay up gold, for alms deliver from death and shall purge away sin. Those who exercise alms and righteousness should be filled with life. Really? Where did he get that? He made it up. That's human wisdom. That's why Jesus got the reaction he did. He just announced that the people that they thought were the most overprivileged in the world were actually the most underprivileged in the world because it led them to think things like this. Things haven't changed much, have they? We still kind of tend to think that way. John D. Rockefeller was quoted one time as saying, the riches were, quote, a gift from heaven signifying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Whoa. That's blasphemous in case you didn't recognize it because that's what God said of his son, right? Jesus is the beloved son. It's not that we're not beloved by the Father, but listen, Folks, our money, whatever God chooses to give us as blessings in this life is not a sign that we're suddenly his beloved son or daughter. The fact that he gave his son for us is the sign that we are his beloved sons or daughters. I think his statement is topped only by one I found from Warren Buffett. You know, a very rich man. A few years ago, I think this was 2006, but don't quote me on that. But he said this, he was going to, whatever amount of money he had then, which was apparently $44 billion or estimated thereabouts. He said he was going to donate 85% of his $44 billion fortune to five charitable foundations. That's pretty generous. Of course, it leaves him quite a bit to live on, right? But still, 85%. Then he said this. He said, there is more than one way to go to heaven, but this is a great way. That's a lot of error in one little statement, isn't it? There isn't more than one way to heaven. There's only one way, according to Jesus. And secondly, 44 billion wouldn't be enough. 85% of 44 billion wouldn't be enough. So 45 billion, 44 billion, uh, 44 billion wouldn't be enough. So certainly 85% of 44 billion wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't be enough. God has no need of money. Somehow, you know, 
we need to be thankful for people that give, right? People who add wings to hospitals. Aren't you glad they do? We were listening to the funeral service for Arnold Palmer the, the other night, sadly missing any reverence to Jesus Christ, but it certainly referenced how he'd given money to add this hospital wing, and Annika Sorensen, another golfer, got up and told how her son's life when he was born had been saved because of the wing that they had added. I mean, it's great that people do things like that. People give money to, to churches. People give money to charities. We should be thankful for that. But the problem isn't that, that we give money, beloved. The problem is that people get to think that this, somehow this is, going to buy, this is going to buy heaven. That's the poverty of riches. Money cannot buy happiness and it cannot buy heaven, but it deceives us into thinking that it can. And so it impoverages us. We become tragically deceived. Listen to what Jesus said to the church at Laodicea. It's a rich, rich church in the first century. In Revelation 3, Jesus, Jesus says this, verses 16 and 17. He says, so because you are lukewarm, you are neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And then he tells why. For you say, I am rich, I am prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? You think you're rich because you've got money in this life, because you've been blessed with some material possessions. Let me tell you, you're blind, rich, na you're blind naked, poor, wretched. That's what you are. Because your riches have impoverished you. They've made you think that they can give you things that they cannot. The impoverishment of riches. Here's the good news. It doesn't have to be that way. The impoverishment of riches can be reversed. After Jesus spoke about how hard it is for the rich person to enter heaven, it's like a camel trying to go through a needle. In other words, virtually impossible, exaggerated statement to make the point. This is how hard it is. It says in verse 26, then those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. There's good news. It's not your money. You don't have to save it up. It's not that your money is going to get you in. You don't need money to get into heaven. You need God to get into heaven. You need to cast yourself on the mercy of God who is always there to give it and to extend it to anyone who will come empty-handed, that's the good news. It's not money you need. It's God. A camel can't go through the eye of a surgical needle and neither can money or good works or whatever else you want to offer gets you into heaven. But what, God, what man can't do, God can and God will. If you just come to him. That's good news because it means the answer to the question who can be saved then is anybody can. Anybody. You just need to come in faith to God. It's the Bible say, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And even that is not your own doing. Even that faith is a gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one can boast. It's not your money. It's not your effort. It's not your time. It's God's grace. It brings us to faith. This one's close to home for me because my printer broke this week, but an office manager had a broken printer. And so he called the shop, you know, where the printer came from, and they told him, yeah, it looks, sounds like from the description it's probably going to be $100 to do a thorough cleaning of your printer. And then, he, then the tech said, but I'll tell you what, if you just get the manual out, I mean, I know $100 is a lot of money, you just get the manual out, you can probably do that yourself. The guy was a little surprised. He said, does your boss know that you're turning down business? And he said, oh, no, my, my boss suggested it. He said, we make a lot more from people who try to fix it themselves. <laughs> you get the point, right? There's a method is madness. Beloved, the same as when we try to fix ourselves. You're trying to put a camel through the eye of a needle, Right? Come and let God do the fixing. When you get done trying to fix yourself, he's ready. He's waiting. He's willing. 
and he is able. Because what is impossible with man is possible with God. So that's the poverty of riches. I hope you've got plenty, but I hope you don't have the poverty that can come with riches. Don't let it pull you in. Nothing wrong with having the money. It's a question of whether the money has you. But then I see something else in this passage. I see the riches of poverty. So we have the poverty of riches, but we also have the riches of poverty. That's the paradox, right? True riches, eternal riches, things that are of eternal value and of eternal worth, don't require money from on earth. They come when we empty ourselves, whatever it is we think we have to offer, and then give ourselves in faith to him, only to find that he gives back infinitely more than we could ever give to him. That's the paradox. That's the riches of poverty. That's why Jesus said, I mean, says, do you understand this is exactly why Jesus says, blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the kingdom? Because it's those who will come offering nothing except their sin to God. Blessed are the poor. This rich man didn't go away richer, he went away poorer. Didn't have to be that way. That's Jesus' message to Peter in the rest of this, in the rest of this section. Peter's seeking reassurance in verse 28 when he says, see, we, and that's an emphatic position there. He's, Peter's saying, we, we, the disciples, we who are following you, we have left our houses and followed you. He's seeking reassurance. We know that because in Matthew's parallel account, Matthew says, Peter went on and said, what then will we have? So see, he's just heard, or he's just seen the rich man walk away, right? Knowing that he's not inheriting eternal life. Then he's heard Jesus turn his world upside down by saying, man, it is so hard for rich people to be saved. And so they're thinking, well, man, if rich people can't be saved, who can? And Jesus says, well, what's impossible with man is possible with God. And so Peter says, well, okay, but where does that leave us? Because we have left all to follow you. Talk about we don't have anything. We've left our jobs. Probably they'd left their families to follow Jesus around if their families didn't come with them in some cases or on some trips. They'd given up everything to follow Jesus. So Peter wants to know, well, what, so what is exactly, where does this leave us? Because we've left all to follow you. Good question. Jesus gives him such a beautiful answer. Look what he says. He says, you've left all, you've become poor for my sake. Believe me, it's going to get worse. You think you've given up a lot now. Wait till you see what's coming. The persecution, eventually you guys will give your life for my sake. Yes, you've left all to follow me, but listen, What you get now and what you get later is going to be way worth more than anything you gave up. Look at it, verse 20, 29. What are they going to get now? He said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times over more in this time. Many as opposed to the age to come. He's saying there's plenty even now that you will receive because eternal life is not just for later it's for now you can receive back a thousand times anything you think you've given up to follow jesus it may be very costly i don't mean to minimize the example jesus gives is very extreme isn't it what if you've lost family what if your wife couldn't go along with you and you came to faith in christ what if your your mother and father disowned you maybe you read the recommended reading book Seeking Allah and finding Jesus about uh, Nabil Qureshi, Muslim who came to faith in Christ, but he was part of a very orthodox Muslim family who truly believed and taught and were teachers in the Muslim faith, and he believed it too. But the more he investigated, because somebody spent four years of their life trying to help him find out about Jesus, and when he came to faith, his, his family did exactly what he expected. They disowned him. He was dead to them. That's an extreme example, but it is a true life example. Suddenly, you come to faith in Christ, even your family is deserted, you're all alone. Except you're not alone. You're not alone. Jesus says, you gave up family, you gave up mother and father, you gave up brothers and sisters, let me tell you, you got hundreds and millions of them that you didn't have before. 
You can't give up more than I can give back. You, first of all, you have a father. In fact, you have a father like no other father. What does he say in John 1.12? But as many as received him who believed in his name, to them he gave the authority to become the children of God. You have authority to become a child of God on your own? No. You see, I thought all people were children of God. Wrong. The lie of the devil that he's perpetuated through time, it's those who believe in him who have the authority that comes from him to become children of God. But now you do that, you put your faith in Christ, and you now have the father of all fathers, right? You have God as your father. How does the Lord's Prayer start? Our Father. In our culture, we have no idea. We've said that so many times and we've prayed that way so many times. We've forgotten the privilege of calling God, who is also our master, who is also our boss, who is also our Lord, the privilege of calling him Father. Our Father. You have a new Father. He's a Father like no other Father. He's a Father who will never leave you. Such a wonderful Father. But only those who have left all to claim Christ can claim God as Father. But now you have a Father. You have a new family. You have the family of God. Did you lose a brother? Not in your life. Turn to Hebrews 2. Well, you're doing Hebrews 2. I'm going to read a verse out of Romans. And Hebrews 2 will be there in just a moment. But Romans 8.29 says this of Christ, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So Jesus has a family, and you as a Christian are part of that family. You're a brother or sister of Jesus Christ as you sit here this morning. That's an amazing concept. Hebrews 2 makes it even more clear. Hebrews 2, beginning in verse 11, here's what he says. The writer says, he says, for he who sanctifies, that is Jesus, and those who are sanctified, that's us. We all have one source, the Father, this is why he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. And then look at verse 12, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. Can you picture Jesus, your older brother, singing your praise in the congregation? Fantastic. Your earthly brother desert you. Your earthly family desert you. You have new family. You have a new father. You have a new brother. You have one who sings your praises. And Ephesians, two, Ephesians 3 kind of describes this a little bit, how God basically sings our praises before the creation, but before the, all, all of the created beings, the good ones and the bad ones, to show off his church, which is in his eyes, wonderful. Not because we're wonderful, but because Jesus is now our Savior and Lord. And as we are growing in him, he can brag on us. Sephaniah 3 talks about God singing over us. Incredible. Ephesians 2.19 says, Then so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Think what we have in Christ, beloved. Think what we have in Christ. We have forgiveness of sins now. We have peace with God who is, you know, all the wrath that he has against sin, including ours, before we come to faith in Christ. When we come to faith in Christ, that's all gone, and we have peace with God, and we have that now. We have no condemnation now. No judgment, no penalty. We have angels watching over us now. We have millions of brothers and sisters around the world now. People who have faith in Christ just like we do. We have a Father who is, according to Ephesians 1.3, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You lack nothing that you need as a believer. You have it all. You may not be appropriating it at all. You may not be using it all from one minute to the next or from one day to the next, but you have it. You have the Holy Spirit living within you and he will never leave you nor forsake you. You have that now. 
We have the resources to meet any circumstance that life throws at us. I say that knowing that as I look out there this morning, some of you have difficulties financially, some of you have whatever job situations, you have relationship situations, but listen, in Christ you have the victory. Now you have somewhere to come and throw your problems. You do. Cast yourselves at his feet. You have him now. I'll tell you what, we have one more thing that we often overlook because we, we so take it for granted. And because, it's, because, because it isn't something we can touch or feel or taste, you know, we're so sensory oriented. It's natural because that's how we view our world, but there's so much more to it. Teacher, Sunday school teacher was teaching her five-year-olds, you know, about the temple and Solomon and how he built this wonderful new building. And she talked about how God came and manifested his presence in this cloud and it came into the building. And she said, and so the presence of God was in the building and the kid's eyes lighted up. And she thought, oh, this is great. I'm getting through them. And then she realized that they weren't thinking presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. -E. They were thinking presence, P-R-E-S-S-E-N-T-S. They wanted the blessings of God more than they wanted the person of God. But that's like us, isn't it? We like God's blessings. But the thing that's most important, the thing we have most of all, is we have the Holy Spirit within. We have Jesus saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you, not till the end of the age. You can go anywhere, and I'm there. You can be in any circumstance, and I'm there with you. I'm yours. And you are mine. What do we get now? And then what do we get then? The last part of Jesus' promise. The promise of reward in verse 30. He says, and in the, in the age to come, you're going to have eternal life. There's the ultimate reward, right? Eternity with Christ. Eternal, eternal life means so much more than longevity, of course. It means to be in the physical presence of Jesus. And it means to be like Jesus. Remember how John said in 1 John 3, I'm, I can hardly wait till I see him because when I see him, I'll be like him. We will be like him. To be in the presence of Jesus forever means no more sorrow, sin, suffering, sickness, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more imperfections, no anything that's bad. You know... <laughs> I, I hate to burst the bubble of some of you because I know you're looking forward to sitting on a cloud forever and playing your harp, right? That's not heaven. Heaven is about taking the God-given gifts that God has given us and exercising productive lives one day after a day, another day after another perfect day forever. You're going to love heaven. And that's what you have. That is what we have in Christ. Priceless. Priceless. The riches of poverty. When we will come to Christ and acknowledge who we really are and accept who he really is. Randy Alcorn gave one more illustration that I thought was very good. He was talking to a lady named Laverne. She was, she was basically on her deathbed from cancer, but um, she wanted to see him, and she said, I have a gift I want to give to the church, and it was, a, you know, it was a substantial gift. And he said, this is great. He said, but you know, you've been a faithful giver as long as I can remember. You, you, you seem to be one of the people who just loves to give. And she said this. She said, let me tell you why. She said, giving melts me. It blows me away to know that God chose me to give. I will soon meet him face to face, and I just want to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I mean, what else matters? That's a good question. What else matters in light of eternity? What else matters? If that rich young ruler had only had the eternal perspective to ask himself, what else matters? if he'd kind of gotten his focus on Jesus instead of on the dollar signs, how much he could have had. He never would have really lost anything. What else matters? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reminder 
I pray that, Lord, anyone who is here this morning has never really put their faith in you, doesn't know you as Savior, and I know there are some in audience this size. I pray that today would be the day they would say yes. Say yes, I want Jesus more than anything else. I truly do. But then for those of us, Lord, who know you, we acknowledge, we admit, we so often get pulled in by the things of this life. We just kind of want our wonders work over time, and they work a lot more toward things than they do toward you. So please help us. Lord, help us to spend the time with you. Help us to learn about you. Help us to be in your word. Help us to be in prayer. The things that would give mass to eternal life instead of mass to the temporal life that we're living now. So that our attraction would gradually move from the one to the other. Help us to be pulled like a magnet toward you because you're so wonderful. Pray that, pray that that would be our experience. Help us now, Lord, as we sing together one more song, really Another strong one here, I surrender. Well, that's, that's a strong thing to sing, but I pray that it will truly represent the prayer of our heart as we close together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me as our praise team leads us and let's sing from our heart. God bless. <laughs>